Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on my tutorials on quantum statistics. So this is video number 28 and I'm going to get the Maxwell, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution function or by maximizing the occupancy function which is also calculating the most probable distribution. Now this won't be in a form yet which you will recognize but don't worry we'll get there. So I'd also like to note that I now have a web, uh, website universityphysicstorials.com The previous video to this I'd like you to, to have seen is where I discussed the occupancy function uh, the, for Maxwell Boltzmann or classical particles, where I discussed optimization and the method of Lagrange multipliers. That's a very important one. Uh, at the very most, you should have seen that. And after this, I'll also be doing calculation alpha and beta, which will be our Lagrange multipliers. And I will be using the density of states in scalar velocity space in order to calculate the Maxwell Boltzmann velocity distribution formula, which you're, you're all, um, I'm, I'm sure, used to seeing. So let's begin. So in previous videos, I calculated the, uh, the, the multiplicity function for classical particles. For classical particles were distinguishable, uh, but they were non-interacting. And the, let's say, the probability classical as a function of n sub s, which is the number of particles in each macro box, was equal to the number of, total number of particles factorial and we had the multiplication over s of the density of states of each macro box to the power of n sub s which is the number of particles in each macro box and then n sub s factorial. Now what we're trying to do is, here is maximize this because if it's maxim if, if this occupancy function is maximized then it is it, you have the most probable distribution. So like I said, see my video when I, talk, I spoke about optimization or maximizing the, uh, the, the occupancy function. So how do we go ahead and optimize this? Well, we optimize it by using the method of Lagrange multipliers. So we're going to we're going to basically use the method of Lagrange multipliers on this. And remember what we did: that you get the gradient of the function you want to optimize, and you use your Lagrange multiplier, let's say alpha, and you use the gradient of your constraint. And if you have two two constraints, it's going to be plus beta, which is second Lagrange multiplier and the gradient of your other constraint. Like that. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, I'll tell you what our constraints are in a moment, but not yet. But this here, p classical sub or of n sub s, is the function which we're looking to maximize. So we need to get its gradient. Now, what is, is it a function of? What here can change? The only thing that can change here is n sub s. That is the variable in this particular function. So we're going to be getting the derivative of p classical so of n sub s with respect to n sub s. Now, it's not easy to do that because it just it's just a horrible looking formula. It is much easier if we deal with the natural logarithm of the function. So now it, it's going to it might get um, I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to get rid of the sub n, the n sub s uh, part, right? So we're going to get the natural logarithm of this. So we're going to get the natural logarithm of this whole whole function here. Okay, so that's going to be the following. It's going to be the natural logarithm of n factorial pi over s g sub s to the n sub s over n sub s factorial. And that's going to be equal to the natural logarithm of n factorial plus the sum over s natural logarithm uh, g sub s to the n sub s over n sub s factorial. Now why is that the case? Well we know that the log of a b is equal to the log of a plus log b and we also know that log a over b is equal to log a minus log b. That's very, there are two very important properties of logarithms. So that's all I did here. Now what I'm going to do now is just amounts to uh, amounts to uh, making it look uh, like a nicer function. Remember what Stirling's approximation said. Stirling's approximation said that the natural logarithm of a factorial is equal to a log a minus a. Okay, and I proved that in a previous video. So let's look at this particular function here. We see we have the logarithm of a factorial here, which I'm going to apply on, onto which I'm going to apply Stirling's approximation. Here we have log a over b, so that becomes log a minus log b. And finally, this would be minus the log of n sub s factorial 
onto which I'm also going to apply Stirling's approximation. Now look, it's not difficult, but in, in fairness to it, it is the algebra is quite a pain in the face. So the logarithm of P classical is going to be equal to the following. We're going to get n log n minus n plus the sum over s. We're going to have n sub s times log g sub s minus n sub s log n sub s plus n sub s. Now if you don't trust my algebra that's just fine but if you go through it nice and slowly you'll see that that is an actual fact the case. Okay? Now where do we go from here? If we note that in actual fact we have the sum over s of n sub s. Now think about it. If we calculate, if we sum up all the possible states in each macro box, well, or each all the number of particles in each macro box, we're just going to get the total number of particles. Look what we have here, the sum over s of n sub s. So what that means, what that means is this and this cancel. Alright, the two of those cancel. And what we're left with as a result is that the log of the probability for classical particles is equal to n log n plus the sum over s of n sub s outside right? outside of the log of g sub s minus the log of n sub s and that's right and one last bracket now that looks that looks like a bit of a pain in the face, but I can assure you that it's after making things a lot easier. Now, it's time to apply the method of Lagrange multipliers. So, in order to get the method of Lagrange, do use the method of Lagrange multipliers, we need to differentiate this with respect to n sub s. All right. So let's go ahead and differentiate this with respect to n sub s. So we have d d n sub s of the log of p. Okay. Now, like I said, it's the subscripts can become a bit a bit of a pain. But anyway, so you have del del n sub s. And I'm going to try and use as many colors as I can to make it as clear as possible. N log n, like that, plus the sum over s del del n sub s of n sub s minus log g sub s minus log n sub s like that okay now n is a constant that is the total number of particles so you can't differentiate it with respect to n sub s because it doesn't change so this is a constant it goes to zero all right now the next thing really we have, I suppose, here is a product rule. We have a product rule, inside, or not a product rule, but we, well, yeah, we do have a product rule inside here. Okay? Uh, because there, that's why we have a product rule. So it's n sub s multiplied by the log of g sub s, and n sub s multiplied by the log of n sub s. So that's why we have a product rule. So let's go ahead and apply our product rule. Okay, so we're going to have the sum over s outside of. We're going to have log of g sub s. We're going to have del n sub s, del n sub s. We're going to have plus n sub s multiplied by del log g sub s, del n sub s, minus del log n sub s over del n sub s times n sub s finally minus log n sub s and del n sub s del n sub s like I said it looks like a pain but in actual fact it's quite straightforward algebra so this here del n sub s this here that's just one so we can get rid of it and uh, this here is one so we can get rid of it okay and 
and this here becomes minus 1. Differentiate log you get 1 over 1 over the function. Okay? So there that's um that just that whole thing, that whole section here becomes minus 1. Okay? So what we're left with is del log p divided by n sub s is equal to the sum over s outside log g sub s minus log n sub s minus 1. And now n sub s and g sub s are enormous numbers, so we can get rid of this one, and we're left with that. So that is the normal vector, or the gradient, of the logarithm of the probability. <laughs> Sounds a bit mad. But I'm sure you're, 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 I'm sure you're uh, happy enough that that isn't too, too difficult. Okay, where do we go from here? Well, we go from here by looking at our constraint functions. We need to look at our constraints and see if we can get the Lagrange multipliers up and running. Okay? So to remind us, we're going to get the gradient of the logarithm of the probability and we're going to get that equal to the uh, alpha Lagrange multiplier, the gradient of constraint con 1 plus beta, the gradient of con 2, like that. Okay, what are the constraints? Well, believe it or not, we've already seen one of the constraints. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what they are. Well, n is equal, the total number of particles is equal to the, the sum of the particles in each macro box. But that's not changing. That's what we saw earlier on. So constraint 1 says the change on the total number of particles, which is the sum of del n sub s is equal to 0. That's con 1. Next, con 2. The energy also is not going to change, so del epsilon, which is equal to the sum over s of epsilon del n sub s is equal to 0. And this is con 2. These are our two constraints. The energy doesn't change, and neither does the total number of particles. Alright? So, what's what, how do we get? Uh, how do we use our Lagrange multipliers? Well, it's going to be as follows. We're going to have del log p uh, del n sub s is equal to alpha del capital N del n sub s plus beta del uh, epsilon del n sub s. Like that. Okay. Now, let's do the derivatives del n, capital N, del n sub s is equal to 1. Sorry, no, that's that's almost correct, but not correct. It's going to be equal, excuse me, the sum over s of 1. And del epsilon, del n sub s, is going to be equal to the sum over s of epsilon. Okay? So we're going to plug those in, and let's see where we go from there. So, we saw a moment ago that... The left-hand side of the equation is the sum over s, the log of g sub s, minus the log of n sub s. Like that. And we know on the right side we have alpha times the sum over s of alpha, or of 1, excuse me. And we have the sum over s, um, we have beta times the sum over s of epsilon. Okay, so that's just going to be the sum over s of alpha, plus the sum over s of beta epsilon. Okay, note everything is the sum over s, so we're going to rearrange it like this. Now, okay, so these are our two constraints. The only way this this formula, or this function, can be satisfied is if uh, we choose it as follows. We say all of the s values are arbitrary because we choose alpha, beta, alpha and beta to, sp to satisfy the two constraints. That means that the logarithm of g sub s minus the logarithm of n sub s is equal to alpha plus beta epsilon, which if we rearrange and take exponentials, or exponentiate, we say that g sub s so you go to n sub s, e to the alpha plus beta epsilon. Or we say that n sub s 
is equal to g sub s e to the minus alpha plus beta epsilon. I'm pretty sure that that doesn't look like what you were expecting, but that is exactly what we what that is that is exactly what we need. We'll find later on that alpha is the chemical potential and beta is one over kT. We'll find that uh, this in this function here we have the occupancy. This becomes the occupancy. So this is the the or the Maxwell Boltzmann occupancy function. This is the density of states. Or no, that's that's wrong actually. This is the occupancy. That's the Maxwell Boltzmann occupancy function, and this is the number of particles. I suppose this is the probability of occupancy, and this is the number of particles occupied. I suppose you could put it that way if you want. Okay. So, that's all I've got to say. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. And you might also check out universityphysicstorials.com. Thank you.